three, two, one. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining for another live interview today on our History Live talks, where we speak to some really interesting people, historians, Egyptologists, archeologists from all over the world. Today's guest is a very, very special guest to have on. His name is Dr. Ramadan Hussein. He is an Egyptian archeologist and Egyptologist who has also studied Assyriology he is also the director of the Saqqara Sait uh, Tombs Project, where he has made some uniquely amazing discoveries. Uh, Ramadan is currently living in Germany, and he has joined us today to talk about some of his discoveries throughout the years at Saqqara and also his life. So Ramadan, thank you so much for joining. Thank you for having me. It's a great pleasure. Uh, it's, it, the pleasure is mine. It's such an honor to, to get to speak to you. Thank you. Yeah, you know, we, we, we've, we know a lot about your accomplishments and everything, but I always would like to start out to get to, to know the person better. So if it's okay, yeah. can I ask a few questions about your, your life? Sure. Sure. So yeah. Ramadan, you, you grew up in Egypt, right? Yes, I was born in Egypt. I was born in Cairo. Um, this huge metropolis, it's just uh, over 17, maybe 18 million people in this city. Uh, it's very huge. And I, um, I grew up, I was born um, in a very old district of Cairo. And everyone who is interested in Egyptology, uh, I bet, knows this district. It's called Bulak because it's the first, uh, the first Egyptian museum was uh, built in Bulak. And this is the Bulak. That's and, the one that flooded, um, right? Yes, and, uh, and this is, um, it's a very interesting uh, district of Cairo because it's very old, um, medieval, and um, you get to see so much of old stuff in this city and this particular district and also has history of it. Everyone who is from Bulak, they feel very proud of uh, that particular district because it also has something to do with modern history and uh, patriotism, especially fighting the French occupation when the French came to Egypt. So I was in this, um, I was a, as a child in this district, I would hear people a lot talking about, um, you know, the past uh, in, in Bulak and see all, see all these old buildings and stuff in there. So mm -hmm. this is, um, yes, this is where I was born. And then I was, um, my family moved to another uh, neighborhood in Cairo not very far from Black, but in the northern part of Cairo, very close to uh, the Delta, the Shobra al <clears throat> And it was- Were you, were you sad to leave this, the, the, the older, more historic site behind? Um, I wasn't, I was sad because my parents' family were still there, um, but just my father and my mother just moved and they're, they're both their families uh, which they, so the uncles, the, the grandparents, everybody was still there. So we had the chance every Friday that we can go uh, see them. But in Shobra Khema, it was, so when I moved, it was just um, a new development that uh, Nasser time that we, he wanted to create a new working community in the northern part of Cairo. Yeah. And very close to the fields, um, especially the cotton fields, um, would establish this big uh, textile factories and other factories and they're moving uh, some of the villagers to this new development um, new city, um, creating a new working class. And this is uh, where my father moved because he was um, a machinist yeah. and he was working in one of these factories. So they offered him a house, a, a bigger house, a much nicer apartment. And then we moved. We were, when we moved there, we were uh, four children. I was wow. um, I'm the oldest. Uh, hey, wait, <laughs> we are six children and uh, I am the oldest of them. Wow. So are any of your other brothers and sisters interested in history and Egyptology? Uh, not exactly. Uh, now they, they like to uh, watch me talking about things, but they're not interested in terms of studying and learning more about it. You know, yeah. The nephews and the nieces are very interested now, oh. which is very good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what was the moment when you realized that you wanted to become an Egyptologist? Uh -huh. um, like every child, well, 
this is a very interesting question because if you ask like 100 archaeologists in the world, um, when that interest got ignited and he, he would say nine years old, 10 years old, 12 years old, usually it is like this. So I'm not exception in this uh, regard. Um, everyone starts, when you have this uh, interest in archaeology in general, it starts really early from the yeah. childhood on. And um, I was about nine years old when I started feeling, okay, I like this, I like history, I like Egyptian um, monuments. Um, it was in a school trip um, uh, to Giza Plateau. And this is a, a nice anecdote that I always like to mention because it really had huge impact on me. Um, it was a school trip and, um, and we had it one day to Giza Plateau from Shobra al Khema all the way to Giza. And for me, that was a big travel. So yeah. um, I was walking up the plateau from Mina House going up to Giza with uh, my friends, my classmates. We were all very young and just holding hands and going up. <laughs> and I do feel, I do remember that feeling um, going up to Giza the plateau. And all of a sudden I felt like the Great Pyramid is moving toward me. Yeah. I was completely taken by the size of the building and um, how huge, how impressive it is. Mm -hmm. And I think I was feeling dizzy at this point and uh, started moving again. And then I feel like I'm connected to this. Um, this was a very powerful mo moment for me. Um, I kept I imagine in the school. Yeah, yeah, Incha is huge, it's big. And uh, we had a fantastic day as children there. And that this is for me, when I grew up, I understood now how important to connect uh, children to Egyptian heritage uh, yeah. or anybody's heritage. There is a way to tell that heritage. And I think um, uh, now after we did this documentary with National Geographic, you can't imagine how many messages I get from children uh, in Egypt and outside of Egypt about um, very tiny detail in the program and very good questions all including why did the busted has six kind of jars and why this and why that what do you do with the mummies and what do you do with the bones so children um, did ask them really good questions about it and I think uh, for me on the school trip this is the time when they tried to connect us to our heritage and all of a sudden one of us that would be me that <laughs> completely hooked and this is what I wanted to do and then I forgot everything about it. And I just kept it history classes in the school until I went to Cairo University. Um, at first, of course, I wanted to be a tour guide. Then I said, no, I don't want to be a tour guide. I want to learn more about it. And then, mm -hmm. but, but this is how it started for me. Yeah. But don't you find that it is actually some of, when you hear questions from the kids, it is really such interesting questions because they, they have such innocent thoughts mm -hmm. Believe me, it, um, it makes me so happy when I get these questions because they're really good questions, not, um, um, which means they paid attention to details. Yeah. And one of the things that it, and also I'm very happy because most of them comes from um, Egyptian kids um, because I think when we were doing this program, we never thought those would be our target or audience. I didn't want to do um, TV at all, never wanted to do TV. Uh, but when I had the, the opportunity and uh, National Geographic people started talking to me and they said they wanted to do actuality, so which means they're going to show us as archaeologists doing, I thought there is a good opportunity to um, carry a message over yeah. and also tell, show the people how we work. And, and away from um, the stereotype of archaeology, getting everybody worked up and excited and Archaeology is exciting enough, but there is a story to be told. So let's stick to the story and it is enough uh, interesting. But the kids were not the targeted audience. I never thought about them, but all of a sudden I get received so many questions from them, which made me think at some point uh, in Egypt in particular, um, are we really drafting our curriculum, school curriculum in a way that um, uh, just bring this interest in the kids out or not? Uh, make them like the topic, make them think about it, um, make archaeology irrelevant, for God's sake, and this is yeah, a yeah. big issue now. I definitely think, you know, to, to reach out to the kids more, I think that's very important. I, I got a message yesterday from a woman in England 
and mm -hmm. she was telling me that her son is autistic and yeah. she said he doesn't have like concentration when he watches yeah. a documentary or a TV program but then mm -hmm. she she said she showed him my documentaries and she said mm -hmm. he was engaged and now he's like I want to go to Egypt so it's important well I'd like yeah I, um, I I feel her and I understand where she's coming from. My oldest son also is autistic mm -hmm. and I know exactly the, the how powerful an image um, would be on uh, autistic children, you know, and how they very connected with an image in particular. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is uh, one of the things that makes me, me very happy is that um, what we did can resonate with a segment of the society that we completely forget when we do archaeology. Um, I think we assume when we do archaeology that we have to water down things for kids to understand. Mm -hmm. But in fact, they surprise us because they can follow a, a storyline and they can follow what we say. So uh, that was a happy surprise for me. The children in Egypt, so many people in Egypt talk, talk to me about their children sitting down watching uh, the series for four days, nonstop waiting for it. And, and that for us, it was a huge success to the entire team working, the filming uh, team and the archeologists as well. Yeah, it was a great series, but Thank you. If, if you could take a group of kids to one site in Egypt to inspire them to become Egyptologists or just interested in the history, what site would it be? Saqqara. Saqqara. Definitely. <laughs> I would go for Saqqara. Of course, um, Thebes would be very impressive and powerful. Thebes um, has a variety of monuments. You would see um, state temples, you would see uh, uh, royal temples, with private tombs. Um, you would see even a settlement in Thebes. So Thebes is fantastic. And in fact, um, uh, Everyone in Egypt is very connected with Thebes because it's the place that we can go and see history. But Saqqara has, uh, for me, has a lot. Um, mm. The story of Saqqara has not been unfolded yet, has not been told yet. Saqqara is still giving us so much to think about. And, um, and this, I was very glad because my project in Saqqara, I never went to there with the intention to make discoveries. I went there to document tombs that already has been excavated in 1899. So that was my main thing, um, to launch a second round of uh, epigraphic survey and documentation and also publication of tombs that Maspero excavated between 1899 and to, uh, 1902. And all of a sudden, the project just had its own self-dynamism. Mm -hmm. We made this big discovery. So I think with even with the discoveries in Saqqara right now, um, all of them about the Ministry of Antiquities uh, announcement, uh, the excavations of Dr. Zahi, Dr. Uh, the excavation of uh, Dr. Muhammad Megahid, uh, the the French working in North Saqqara, the uh, the Dutch Italian mission, the Cairo University mission. There's so many missions working in Saqqara, and I think Saqqara. Um, we know much about Thebes. But I think by now, it looks like we, we don't know a lot about Saqqara. Yeah. And in the so near I, future, we will learn more about it. Yeah, I love Saqqara. It's, I didn't feel like I'm in Egypt, you know, mm -hmm. ancient Egypt, until I visited Saqqara. So mm -hmm. there's definitely something special about, about yeah. that place. Yeah, it's also, um, the good thing about Saqqara is that um, um, it is isolated and you don't see a lot of uh, urban encroachment on it. Uh, so Thebes, you would see the nice, um, you know, intertwine of modern houses with the ancient uh, monuments. This is a good aspect. You can think about how the locals would really think of their uh, archaeological heritage and how they live by it. But Saqqara, you feel a little bit of isolation yeah. that you can um, get the sense that you are back into ancient Egypt. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. But uh, Ramadan, you, you left um, Egypt and you went and studied in America, in the yeah. USA. Was this your first time to the USA? First time to go on a plane. <laughs> <laughs> first time ever. And it had the, um, it was in, uh, I remember that day because it was, uh, it's in, of course, it's in a, a very historic day in in, in my life, it was um, exactly um, August 28th, 
2001, mm -hmm. which, mean, uh, which means I was in the U.S. almost 12 or 13 days before 9-11. Oh, yeah. So, um, but it was the first time for me to uh, travel abroad, to get on a plane, and uh, had an unstop flight from Cairo to New York, um, Egypt Air. It was about uh, 11 hours. And then I had the bus from New York to Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, where Brown University is, but the, it was the first time for me. Yeah, yeah. And how was the the adjustment to the U.S. compared to Cairo? Fantastic question because I I had this question. It was about um, two weeks after I went to Providence, Rhode Island. Providence is very small. Providence is almost like tubing in now. So um, I had a, a friend of mine was asking me how do you feel in Providence? I said, oh, he talking, I was born in Cairo. I grew up in Cairo. This is it's a very, very crowded city. And I knew, I know every single street in, on this metropolis. It's huge and I know it all. Mm -hmm. So Providence is tiny for me. It was nice change, but I knew exactly why I was going to Brown. And I knew it is an opportunity. And um, I knew opportunity, uh, you grab, you don't um, get it offered to you. Um, and when you get it, don't just waste it because it's one time, you get the opportunity one time. And Brown for me was a huge transformative experience. Um, I, was, I was going there with so much, um, I've learned uh, with Dr. Zeh in his office when I was working for him. I worked um, at Giza Plateau uh, as inspector for about seven years um, before I went to Brown. Mm -hmm. um, I had, it was for me a formation uh, period, um, learned how to do excavations, how to write reports, um, how to read uh, Egyptological literature, uh, looking at different topics. Um, it was fantastic to um, build up that foundation you need for graduate school. Yeah. Maybe I was I started late than uh, what a normal American student would start a graduate school, but those uh, years were not in vain. I just had this huge background um, of Egyptology readings and contacts with uh, scholars, even um, Brown University. Um, professors already knew me before I went to Brown. Uh, oh, wow. Ed Provarsky, yeah, Ed Provarsky, uh, Leonard Lesko, those were, um, Leonard Lesko by the time was the chairman of the department. Mm -hmm. So when they, when they admitted me, they already knew me and, and I was going there prepared. Yeah. Then I needed to build up on this and Brown is very vibrant uh, graduate school. It was the program we had about diff five different uh, programs for ancient studies. Wow. It was Egyptology as a department, a single department, and it was uh, classics with anthropology, the old old world archaeology, which is the Zhukowski Institute now. We have ancient uh, art, we have Judaic studies, and there was a big umbrella that brings all these ancient studies departments together. So. And all of a sudden, I'm not talking just to Egyptologists. I'm talking to different <laughs> people in different disciplines. And that was, for me, a very uh, transformative. Um, I had to, I was listening to different disciplines, how they approach their material. What can we think? And if all of this, um, when I was at Brown, I had the chance, the ability to, to teach. Uh, Brown would, when you were as, as a graduate student, they would give us a chance to teach one class uh, during graduate school years. But I was teaching, I, taught, I ended up teaching six years out of my, my nine years at Brown University. Wow. And I was, um, yeah, and I was uh, um, teaching also at the anthropology department in Rhode Island College. And let me tell you, working with those anthropologists, it was fantastic. Um, yeah. I had to sit down, I sat down with them, uh, uh, thinking about Egyptian material from an anthropological perspective. Uh, and then all, all of a sudden you talk to a classicist in a different department or a Judaic studies person. And, and at this point, you understand exactly um, how it would be to do ancient studies on interdisciplinary uh, level. Yeah. Um, you, don't, you get a step out of your comfort zone. And this is very good uh, if you, if you, 
they always a challenge is something that makes you create something mm -hmm. you make you creative so stepping out of your comfort zone is what i was always looking for um so brown has given me this uh, rhode island college uh, in america has given me this so my years in america were absolutely transformative yeah i was um i, I have so many good memories uh in the u.s and the education and, and the support from the people I got it's you know when when you accomplish something there is always people that have um extended their hands and they supported you and provided you with um you know the support system you need mm -hmm. and there's so many of them in my life in Egypt uh in America Either it's a family, it's family in America or family in Egypt, um, professors and friends in America, it's everywhere. And this is, you don't really um, succeed unless you have this uh, support system behind you. And when you um, get to a point of accompli accomplishing things and people recognize your accomplishment, I think it's the time for you to say, I had a very good support system. And yeah. thank you for everyone. Yeah, that's that's very true. And you also you get the chance to to speak to these people. You get to swap ideas, hear their yeah. opinions, and that's so important. I've been speaking to so many people, and yeah. I also I understand what you mean. It's so important to have that group that you can really rely on. So. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And and now now you're in Germany and you're there with your family and you are a professor at a university there how how have you perceived the germans love for egyptology now that you're ah. well i you know when i was um at cairo university studying for my ba uh it's everyone thinks okay there are two um three four different places you want to go to to, to continue with your egyptological studies germany would always be uh, number one we all want to go to germany um as uh, young students you know, america england france those are the big four that you want to uh, uh, go to when you do Egyptology. Um, I never meant, I never, uh, when I went to uh, America, um, I never thought to come to Germany, thinking about coming to Germany and uh, living there. But um, right after I finished my PhD in America, I went back to Egypt and I was working at the Ministry of Antiquities. Uh, it was still the Supreme Council there. Mm -hmm. And I worked for the Documentation Center and uh, helped out Dr. Zehi in so many capacity. And then uh, after the revolution, I was director to his, uh, the minister's office, so pretty much second in command. And then all of a sudden it's like, okay, um, with the revolution and everything's boiling up in Egypt, I don't think it's time. Uh, um, it's you're spending the five years of doing nothing because it's not gonna settle in, until, uh, you know, there is a stable government. So I went back to the US and I, um, a chance to look, uh, I was looking for jobs in the US for almost a year and a half, uh, applied for everything. It was at some point I was thinking to quit Egyptology completely. No. And look at, yeah, that was um, exactly 2012. Uh, it was very painful that I, when I was uh, thinking about this, um, um, I was I was helping a lot in the ministry and in, by the end of 2011, I left and went back to uh, the US and looking for things, for jobs, is, there's nothing available. And it was at some point I had to say, okay, I'm a father and I have a family. Maybe um, Egyptology is not it. I need to go somewhere. I need to do something else, look for a job. But the only thing that kept me really was I applied, it was a job at uh, the Griffith Institute um, in Oxford. Yes. And then uh, they were trying to digitize the uh, the Griffith Institute archives and linking it to um, the uh, the annual Egyptological bibliography, which is on Egyptological bibliography now. So I applied for this job. It was a three uh, year position, and Griffith Institute in Oxford. And all of a sudden, they shortlisted me. Uh, and I'm saying this anecdote in in exactly in in the context of really appreciating the support and the help you get, even if it's not direct help. Um, 
they uh, shortlisted me and I had an interview with the, um, with the uh, committee. It was John Baines, uh, Elizabeth Froude, uh, McNamara, uh, Mark Smith, and another person from a sociology. I'm sorry for forgetting the name. But and Elizabeth people, Froude, she's, she's such a nice name. She, she is amazing. And I, I knew her, it was about 2012. Um, and I had this interview with them, all, all committee was just amazing people, very nice. And this is coming for me at the time that I was completely down and I was completely ready to quit. But I see those big names, uh, John Baines, Elizabeth Hood, uh, McNamara, Mark Smith, absolutely the nicest people you could have on an interview, a job interview. And for me, um, that changed my, uh, my perspective on my career completely because I was about to quit and I say, this is it. But first thing I got shortlisted at Oxford and this is huge. Second thing was like, I get really a nice interview with those uh, people, even though I didn't get the job. But this is in the context of maybe when you, a, a nice word you would have said to somebody, it would completely change their career and their life and leave an impact, even if you don't intend so. But being um, collegial with somebody, um, being absolutely accepting to somebody has definitely a huge impact on me personally. And this is um, an anecdote that I always like to mention. And I thank, even though I didn't get the job, but I thank this committee and I thank those individuals. Probably the first time they will hear this. But this is what happened. Um, um, I was about to quit. And those people pretty much indirectly told me, don't know, you can make it. And uh, after that, I applied for um, Alexander von Humboldt uh, postdoctoral fellowship in Germany. And this is something very, very big in German community in Europe. Um, and I got two year fellowship. And um, yes, the other support and help I got from Kristen Lights. Uh, he's the head of the department here in Tübingen. He didn't know me before uh, I came here. It was the first time when I came, in fact, to, we met. Uh, but he read my application and I said, listen, I want to apply for Humboldt. And uh, here's what I, it's, there was a mutual friend who put us in contact. Mm -hmm. And I told him, here's my idea for research. And he was like, wrote immediately, told me, okay, listen, Humboldt is very big in Germany, very competitive. And I see your, um, your proposal is very good, but here's how you get it really um, in this competition. And uh, he gave me some uh, pointers and it was fascinating. Then I came to Germany. It was, if America is very transformative in terms of education, Germany is really transformative in terms of research, networking and connection with, uh, uh, with, uh, with the European community in general, yeah. because it made it really available uh, to me, especially also Tübingen is very nicely uh, positioned and located in Germany. We're uh, Southwest, so we nearby France, uh, Belgium, uh, Holland, uh, Italy, Switzerland, uh, the Czech Republic, every powerhouse of Egyptology in Europe is just <laughs> around us. So, <clears throat> Heidelberg is very close to me. Um, so it was uh, amazing uh, to have had the training and the bringing up in Egypt and having a direct context with the monuments itself and the, the archeology, span then go back to go to America, get the uh, proper education and theoretical factual education, how to bring all these together, coming to a new environment that is Germany for research basically. Um, and, and get more contacts with other European powerhouse Egyptology in Europe, that I consider myself absolutely lucky to have had that progression in my career. Yeah, yeah. That's absolutely amazing how, how things work out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So to, to your archeological career, you have a list of accomplishments that is so extensive. We could literally do a whole interview just on each dig. Mm. Um, so where was your first dig? Ah, my first one was in Saqqara, 
it was in uh, 1995, and uh, Dr. Zay was conducting excavations in the um, cemetery, the Titi Cemetery, which he is now um, back on that site. And it was the uh, digging the Valley Temple of Queen Iput, um, one of the queens of King uh, Titi first. And um, I was, there was people working there. And of course I, I went there with zero knowledge on field method and how to do it. So pretty much I was watching uh, people uh, doing their work. And you know, when you, you learn on the job. Yeah. And that was the first thing. Um, I was learning on the job, why to go there. And then the, I moved from um, uh, looking over workmen and people doing this and then went to the storeroom. And in the storeroom, I saw all these artifacts. My job was to start registering everything and recording everything. Yeah. I didn't know how to do this, but you know what? I thought, I thought okay, knowledge is always in a book. So go find some books about how to do this and then go do it. And this is um, about self-motivation and also um, being self-taught person. You always say, okay, um, I don't know this, but there is always a book that you can read and learn from. Yeah. So don't um, ever stop and say, this is not, I, I don't know how to do this. Because everything, you can learn everything. You can learn whatever and yeah. start doing it. And nowadays I'm reading so much about um, uh, mummification uh, business and mummification text, mummification this. And this was not on my research agenda. Mm -hmm. But the first time I was working, uh, first place I excavated was in Saqqara. Um, and then um, the other excavations was in Bahreya Oasis. It's a completely different environment, um, different uh, late, late you know, early Roman uh, period cemeteries and late period Egypt tombs. It was also different from what I've seen in Saqqara. So mm -hmm. those were the first two. And then I excavated um, at uh, Giza Plateau with Cairo University and Brown University. That was a joint project. It was in what we know as the Abu Bakr cemeteries. It's a section of the Western Cemetery, all the way Northwest. Um, and it was originally a concession by Cairo University. And um, the excavation was led by Abdel Menem Abu Bakr. He was a professor there. Then it was, um, it was in the 60s and then stopped. So Brown University has a collaboration with, Brown, with, um, with Cairo University to go back and re-excavate document and publish this cemetery. And I had the uh, pleasure to be working about three to four seasons um, on this one. And the last season I was deputy director of the projects. So, so working Saqqara, Bahreya, Oasis, Giza was uh, the places that I liked very much. Yeah, yeah. And you, you mentioned that you, you worked a lot with Dr. Zahi Hawass. And he, he must have been an amazing person to, to work with and to learn from. He has been so nice towards me. We've known each other for a couple of years and we email back and forth and he's always very encouraging and always has great words to say. Mm -hmm. So how was your experience working with him? Um, I think there is one side of Zahi's work that uh, people don't pay attention to or um, media is not focusing on how visionary he is. Yeah, he he is a really visionary uh, person. He knew exactly what is lacking in uh, Egyptian antiquities, uh, what is lacking in Egyptian archaeology on the Egyptian side of this discipline, and he tried to fill in these gaps um, on the organization level. How to organize the the ministry uh, or the Supreme Council when he had it and putting rules for things that was, you know, creating an institution, how to run the Egyptian heritage. But I think his biggest legacy, uh, in my uh, opinion, would, uh, would be his investment in um, younger generation in Egypt. Um, I am an example, Yasmin Shazli is an example. Um, uh, another people who worked with us, uh, Muhammad Megahid, uh, Muhammad Ismail, 
those are people uh, we learned in his office how to do things. Um, he, we had an opportunity to look at books and read and all this and get in touch with and contact uh, foreign scholars. But he also knew that Egypt needs a new generation of Egyptologists. And he knew that um, the only way to create this cadre of Egyptian Egyptologists is by selecting some and investing in them and giving them the proper education uh, somewhere. I think this is how visionary he is. And when he understood um, there is a problem, there is something missing in the organization we need to build up, um, have a capacity building human infrastructure for Egypt if we want to compete. Um, yeah, it was something I am very grateful for having the opportunity and um, learning in the office how to do things and learning on the field how to do things and um, understanding also something important to help uh, other people. Yeah. Um, give an opportunity to people and also uh, be able to spot a talent is very good at spotting talents, by the way. <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah, he is. He's an amazing man. I would say so. Yeah. 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 But now, of your your many discoveries, which discovery are you most proud of? <laughs> the mummification workshop with every single thing in it. Um, it's it's very. Uh, um, of course, it's the big thing that we made, um, even this interesting uh, gilded silver mask. Um, it's the, you know, the, it's a third of its kind. Um, the, the whole structure itself, the whole complex itself is very, very unique, even though we don't have the big, uh, you know, nice scenes and texts on the walls and things, but it's an indication of a lived culture in Egypt uh, in the late period, um, a lived tradition, a lived religion um, in ancient Egypt um, during the seventh century. Uh, first thing, we never had a, we're ne as archeologists, we we're never able to um, identify structures as those where the mummification took place. We knew everything about it. We knew the process, we knew the rituals uh, from texts. Uh, when he, when he, even the organization of that business, the mummification business, since it was a big industry, we knew who is running it. We knew the class of priests involved. We knew how they were uh, priests, but also professionals. Uh, they, they have a craft and also um, business people. Yeah. We have good uh, textual evidence for all this, the contracts, um, between themselves and among themselves and even contracts with the individuals. So this um, business side is very well detailed in the textual uh, evidence, but to find the co architectural context for all this yeah. and to, uh, to localize all these enterprises that's happening in it and, and transactions and to say, okay, this is where the, the, the places where everything took place. Um, and I was just talking uh, last week um, in, in a lecture for the Torino Museum, and I was able to say even the nomenclature, the names of tombs and shafts that we see on the papyri, we can really um, assign them to the, the different uh, tombs that we have in our mummification complex. We can uh, say, here is the Wabit, the workshop, here is the Ibu-like uh, structure, um, and here is the communal burial place that this funeral business is uh, building. Yeah. And there was one stele I was about to, uh, I wanted to show it to people in, uh, in that lecture, but I decided not to. It's a stele from Florence. Um, and the stele is pretty much a contract uh, about a transaction, the, sale, the purchase of an uskrit, a hallway, and the tombs around that uskrit. That transaction happened between two priests, an embalmer and um, a kawakite or the libation priest. And those were the people who really running this funeral service uh, place and running the business. So 
this is what I found. Is is it, that Stila is that Stila on display in Florence? Because I have seen it a couple give, of times. So I think I have uh, the number for it. Um, uh, I, I wrote it somewhere. It. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, uh, I I can I can tell you the number of it, but I can uh, look for it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think you can send me but, that later. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's um, fascinating to be able to look at text and match this text with archaeology, mm -hmm. and here since I always say I'm a very lucky person, having the archaeological training and the field methods and understanding how to do excavations and then go going to Brown University and Brown is um, a text based culture. Um, a, always a, a discipline about texts and about uh, studying religious text and pretty much philology. It's a philological tradition at Brown. So mm -hmm. I went to Brown and I got this philology aspect all working on texts all the time and grammar and all this. But at the same time, I can do excavations. So you go, you're standing on the field, you're having both knowledge together, the archaeology and the text. And when you're able to match these two, this is great because uh, one of the flaws of Egyptology is always this, you know, um, yeah. <laughs> disconnect. It's always yeah. disconnect. Um, the art historians would be doing art history, not talking to the archaeologists and the philologists, not talking to anyone, focus on the grammar, on the text, and not looking at the culture that produced this text and how the text was living in the culture. Um, so I was happy because um, I was able to do both. Yeah. And when I was excavating this place, I knew exactly what um, a wabit uh, looked like and what an ibu looked like because mm -hmm. I had a training and I was working in Giza and I saw this nice ibu scenes on the tomb of Kar and Edo. So um, I was looking at the layout of the structure we discovered I was like, this is amazing. This is exactly what you, the two dimensional representation of the Ibu, uh, which it's, is connected it's so to the environment. Interesting. The, the Ibu is usually thought of being a, a tent yes. above ground. Yeah. Um, but the one that you discovered was yeah. underground. Yeah, I was, and I was even uh, saying, I said, I don't know why we as Egyptologists think it was a tent um, and where we got this uh, translation from. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the Ibu could have been, I mean, the valley temples themselves in the old kingdom could have been the Ibu, the royal Ibu. Because yeah. Their layout is very similar to them. Um, and, and I also mentioned that story about how I was uh, trying to draft the Ibu that Salim Hassan um, noticed in front of the valley temple of Kafre. And I failed to do that when I was working at Zahi and I couldn't see any traces for it. Uh, and then I went to the tomb of Carr, looking at the representation, but this we're talking about uh, 1999 or even 1998. But in 2017, I am looking at an actual Ibu um, on the ground. And I was very happy because this is a thing that was staying here, you know, yeah. but being able to match um, art, archeology, span um, text, all this together, this is what, what constitutes Egyptian culture. Yeah. So as an archaeologist, it's not enough. It's good to do field method and record everything because this is basic, you know. Recording everything is amazing because what we do in the field is we harvest information. We don't know what we're harvesting exactly and who is going to be using it and what good for it. But um, you make, you collect the information and then comes the time to start investigating. Mm -hmm. But also if you have the philological background then the textual knowledge as well on the field, it helps you so much to interpret what you have found. Exactly, exactly. And it's, it's a very exciting discovery. It's changed the idea of the mummification process with the, yeah. with the area it was done in, yeah. Yeah, believe me, um, we are doing the residue analysis on 55 uh, samples of all those uh, cups and bowls that we found in the mummification workshop. Um, only 55 and we have hundreds of these ones. 
yeah. the 55 samples so far are um, yielding shocking results as to what kind of trees we have these um, oils and resins mm -hmm. and where they're coming from. The, these trees, it's nothing where, uh, very close, nothing um, anywhere close to Egypt. They're very far. And then you're talking about international uh, trade network that is supplying this flourishing and thriving industry in Egypt that is mummification. So now we're taking mummification outside of the Egyptian context into the international context and the impact of this industry in Egypt on another industries outside of Egypt and international trade uh, network. Yeah. Um, we, uh, in the, we are in the process to write uh, this report and uh, hopefully when we publish it, we can tell people exactly where the place is of these trees coming from, which means um, all these oils and resins, there was a worldwide network of uh, trade that is just supplying Egyptians with the need of these um, resins and oils. And what is so interesting also is that um, in the Ptolemaic period, this substance, the mummification substance, there was a tax on these substances. So the state, so that the embalmers are making money. So why not the state have its share in the form of taxes? And some of those um, uh, um, 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 substances had their own, they were taxed specifically. Certain substances, they were taxed because that means it's because really the exotic. Animals. Yeah, the animals. Yeah. So I think this one aspect, I never thought to do anything about mummification. There was always in the bottom of my interest as Egyptologist, never thought uh, talk about it, but now I saw um, how important to talk about it from um, as a business, as a cultural practice, and also as a set of rituals. And what it, why the Egyptians really want, oh, that's another question that was very nice from a child. Why the Egyptians wanted to be mummified? Yeah. Like, what's the point? You know, the, the 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 point of mummification is that you're subjecting the human body into a process of transformation. It's not just preserving this body. Preservation of the body is a requirement for the final transformation of the person. Mm -hmm. So think about it: if you have a production line, you get the human cadaver, and on the production line after 70 days of subjecting it to medical preservation processes and also rituals in, during the 70 days and bodily treatment, at the end, you're producing an Osiris. Yes. So you have um, the deceased Ramadan Hossein. He goes in uh, on this production line, get all the set of rituals and bodily treatment in order to produce an object that is Osiris Ramadan Hossein. Mm -hmm. And Osiris, so the, the, the epithet Osiris became a gender. A woman and a man can be Osiris. Yes, and, as, we, and, as we see with, with uh, Nefertari's tomb, she's depicted as Osiris with the right. beard. Yeah, because it, a mummification is a process of transformation. Uh, you take in the person, you transform him, um, making this person an Osiris. In fact, he's not an Osiris unless there is a mummification happen. Yes. Is, so I think there's so much to talk about in terms of um, about mummification in terms of um, the culture of mummification, yeah, the business, sure. the meaning of it, why they were doing it, how this is a completely different issue. And yeah. now we have some nice material that we can talk about all these um, substances. And one thing that I would love to do in the future, um, once we have those substances, we can take our research to a completely different discipline, not Egyptology, not humanities, but into anatomy. Yeah, yeah. Exciting stuff. And, not, and I can't tell you why we're taking it into anatomy now, because I'm, I'm talking to anatomists here in Tübingen. Um, we have some good um, a planning for a bigger project. Once we come up with our residue analysis and identify all these oils and resins, um, my thing is, I always um, believe that archaeology and Egyptology in particular 
is a field where natural sciences and humanities can intersect. Mm -hmm. And this is, it's all about the archeology span to come up with the, to, to initiate the question and come up with the research agenda and then um, ask the natural scientists, invite them to come and look at the material because when you dig, you, you produce knowledge. The only thing is about the dig and the excavation is the knowledge production. Mm -hmm. And the material is your way to produce this knowledge. Then you need the other disciplines to come in. So if as an archeal, as a, a field director and, and a, somebody who is excavating, it's not enough to find something. It's not also enough to, to understand it. You have to share it's it. Always sharing, sharing is important and always, um, you need to come you with a renewable research agenda all the time, because what you have is an object that you need to interrogate all the time. And, and we, I'm talking to so many disciplines here in Tübingen, outside of Tübingen, because we have such a wealth, um, as I said it one time, we have a gold mine of information and we need to mine this gold, gold mine. Yeah. 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 Are we gonna get a new documentary about all these finds? I think with the corona, there is no more documentaries now. But um, yeah, we, we, we might have something in the future. But, uh, you know, as I said, I never wanted to do documentaries unless there is uh, something to be said about it. Um, uh, there is, should be a message if we should be giving a new, um, getting out of the stereotype of archaeology, uh, you know, and it's, it's not, our, it's, yeah, it, well, part of huge part of it is the archaeologist's for, fault. How we um, really introduce archaeology to the interested people and also the general public. Um, our message and our rhetoric about archaeology should be more. Um, we should um, make archaeology more relevant. Mm -hmm. And this is it's not enough to find uh, old stuff and be good. And because this is a um, one of the questions that all those people say, was, okay, you found this all, what's that going to do for me? Yeah. You know, why, why, why this is important for me now, especially when I speak about it. But if you talk to them about um, a mummification workshop, for example, from an economic perspective and how an ancient economy was working and how a modern economy would work and that makes them understand, okay, the ancient were also human. Yeah, and exactly. They, they, their life is exactly, I am a continuation of their own life. Yeah. And now we understand it, we need to learn this. Um, how our message should be different as archeologists, our rhetoric should be different to um, make archeology span more relevant to people. That is, that is something that I'm always, trying to do i believe in that as well make it relevant for people so new generations can also take it on um, yeah. and also to remind people that yes these ancient people we read about them but they were real people they were like yeah. us yeah. yeah yeah so if you if you uh, do find something really interesting and you feel like making a documentary give me a call <laughs> <laughs> sure <laughs> So in, uh, in this documentary that came out uh, last year about your discoveries at Saqqara, at one point uh, you found a tomb, a set mm -hmm. of tombs, and you were with uh, Salima. And uh, mm -hmm. at one point we saw you getting quite emotional. Why yeah. do you think it was such a, a big moment in your life? Um. We made before that moment. We made a bigger discovery that was the 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 mask and everything. But the mask was not on film. Um, yeah, it was a number of feelings that hit at the same time. Uh, the the childhood, the hardship of the childhood you went through, um, the, the 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 many things, the many sacrifices you had to do um, to make on the way. Mm -hmm. And also the appreciation you have for your support system uh, from every person who helped you. Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, this is the first time I'm going to talk about this. What triggered this moment, in fact, when I was talking about my team, when I was talking about the, the entire team, 
um, I started to get emotional because um, I was seeing those young uh, Egyptians and uh, Germans uh, working with me and all of them, they, they, none of them was really stingy with their effort and time and complete dedication to the project. Yeah. And I was about to say, about, about to tell them thank you, but I was just like, I'm, I feel so lucky to have such, you know, dedicated group of uh, young people working around me. And in fact, when I was about to say thank you to them, uh, I got very emotional, but um, there's so many things. Um, the, the upbringing, the, the childhood, um, the, you don't, also you know that archeology span is not fair. Our discipline is not fair. Um, it's a very difficult field. So many um, hearts got broken in this field because we all get attached to this archeology span when we are very young. Um, the, the most brilliant of us don't make it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the thing. The most and like brilliant. Like you said, you were you were going to, to give quit. up. You were going yeah. to give up Egyptology. Yeah. And... yeah, I was about to quit, and 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 it was. It's a very difficult field, and when you, as I said, when you make it, um, it's a time to say thank you, not to just be happy about your accomplishment. Um, and as I said, this is a very difficult and tough field. So many of us um, just quit because there is no much there's not a lot of opportunities so mm -hmm. once you get an opportunity uh make sure there is 100 other people didn't get it so yeah. um you know be grateful be thankful and it was a moment for me i wanted to thank everyone so but just came yeah so. yeah wow well that is such a an amazing story it's also very touching um, I'm sure a lot of us watching now can also relate with you about struggling to get somewhere. And when you get there, it's that feeling of everything sort of come together. Yeah, definitely. Um, it just hit from every side. I, I didn't know which, which memory is coming uh, at what time. But um, and also, you know, um, for so many years, um, men try i mean strong men try to hide their weaknesses and their tears but i think um a strong men is the ones who can show emotion yeah you know? they're not afraid uh, to yeah you're not afraid to. and also especially if this emotion is precious and it has a uh, a message and a meaning so but um but believe me, it wasn't intended. It, I wasn't planning it. It was just, you know, Salima is, was there uh, standing. And this is one of the people who, when I was young, she was always coming to our office at Giza and talking to me as a young uh, Egyptologist. But now she is, um, you know, we're working together. We're colleagues. We're sharing um, a documentary. So you've come so far. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I was like, thank you for everyone. I would have been crying just because I was standing next to Salima. <laughs> someone I've looked up to for years and years. So yeah, <laughs> yeah I, can, I can understand that. Yeah. So as one of my final questions, before we take some questions from the audience, because we have quite a big audience tonight. So I'm sure they're going to awesome. have some very good questions. Yeah. What is one misconception about Egyptology that you would like to change? Mm. Uh, the, the only misconception that um, I don't, I would like to change is um, uh, the, the, the aliens built Egyptian civilization. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's very hard, and uh, you know, there is the pseudo archaeology is fine. You know, pseudo archaeology, which means you get this is your alternative archaeology. Um, people have their own idea about interpreting facts, uh, archaeological facts, and stuff like that. This is fine because I think this is also a discipline of its own. 
No, we can interrogate, we can explain, we can sit down and discuss, but um, denying a certain community the ability to build the civilization is a little bit uh, racist. You know, yeah. there is a lot of uh, uh, racism undertone in that particular belief. Oh, the Egyptians cannot do this. They can't do it. No, they're, 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 That's crazy. they don't have the mental capacity. They don't have the intelligence to do this. So I think it's, yeah, the, the aliens issue is, um, yeah. also you, you doubt the ability of humans mm -hmm. to build the civilization. Because when you look, they, they, you know, these, these people who always talk about aliens and things like that, yeah, yeah. and they always say, every stone on the pyramid is perfect and equal. I'm like, no, when you stand there and you look at it, you can see the, the, the different yeah. cuts and it's, some of it's really messy, some of it's perfect, some yeah. of it's, yeah. you can see. Yeah, and, I, and as I said, it's just a, denying um, the human race the ability to build a magnificent civilization. Even though we, we live, we're very civilized. We have some fantastic inventions going up to the moon and trying to get to Mars and all these things. Um, why not? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, Ramadan, this has been so much fun. We could talk for hours and hours, I'm sure, about all your experiences, your finds. Um, and I, I have so many more questions in my head about Saqqara and like um, when you found the, the five or six mummific uh, canopic jars, why were there so many? I have so many questions. We'll have yeah. to save that for another 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 interview. So sure. Sure. Yeah. but you have just been such a, a, a delight to chat to. And thank I you. thank you for your time. Thank you. And before we get to taking some audience questions, I have some quick fire questions for you. Are you ready? Awesome. <laughs> Go ahead. Favorite place in Egypt? Oh, that's a car. <laughs> Favorite place out of Egypt? Oh, there's so many. Um, you, 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 you. I would say two. Uh, Brown University and Tübingen. Okay, okay. Yeah. Your favorite artifact? Uh, gilded silver mask discovered in Saqqara in 2018. <laughs> I wonder who discovered that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, forget about Tutankhamun. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, forget about this guy. <clears throat> he's, he's, he's old news. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Favorite, favorite pharaoh? Oh my, um, Tutmosis the third. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not Ramses. No, I think Tutmosis had, um, he was a strategist. He's also, he had a vision. Mm -hmm. Favorite queen. Ooh. Favorite queen. Uh, um, Titi Sherry. Titi Sherry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Proudest moment in your personal life? When, um, when, when Ben does his homework. <laughs> 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 <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, I'm sure I love so it. This is a this is huge accomplishment to get your child to do your homework, uh, to do his homework. Oh, <laughs> this is huge. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, Ramadan, thank you so, so much for taking the time to talk to us. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Sophia, for helping to set all of this up. Uh, yeah. I'm sure, Ramadan, we'll do another interview sometime and hear about more discoveries. Yeah. And Sure. Thank you for having me. And uh, I look forward to questions. Oh, thank you. And so I'm going to hand over to the audience now. Um, we'll take our first question. Aset. Okay, you know, I always have questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes. I'll, I'll set go so, first, and then we'll go to Vanessa. <laughs> okay, thank you. Ramadan, I so, so, so enjoyed your talk with us today. Thank you so much. This was really okay. wonderful. Um, Saqqara is also one of my favorite places in Egypt. And I have, like Curtis, many questions. 
but um, I'm going to narrow it down to the one. Mm -hmm. Always in Germany, um, or because I have a, once tourism begins to open back up again, I have a tour company and we've got a group coming. I don't know if it would be possible if you're ever, you know, in Egypt, how, how would we connect with you? Could you get us into a kind of an off the beaten path plans, Cara, to share with our group um, something that's there of, of interest or that, that you've been working on? Sure. I mean, there is a way um, in the Ministry of Antiquities, there is uh, regulations on how, how to do this. And um, if you contact them um, and if you would like, we can just start talking to them, of course. Yeah, there's always a way to do it. OK, how often do you go over to um, well, the, the pre-corona time, I was always working uh, spring and autumn. Uh, now, I haven't been to Egypt since um, yes. December 2019. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Aset. Vanessa, go ask your question. Thank you. Ramadan, I wanted you um, to refresh my memory, please, about the lion cub that you found um, in Saqqara, the mummified lion cub. Was, was that actually found interred with one of the um, burials, one of the human burials, or was it part of an animal? Um... Yeah, but um, it was found by the, um, the, um, the mission of Dr. Mustafa Wazir um, in the Bubastian area. And this is completely not our concession. It's the Ministry of Antiquities uh, concession. Um, I think, according to the information we got from the Ministry of Antiquities, it was found in one of these uh, shafts um, that was that was cut into inside into the precinct of uh, the Bubastian. And this excavation is very interesting because it proves what I was talking about in terms of the business of embalming and the funeral service together, and who was running what. And um, the change of the burial custom and the change of the pattern of burial, um, people more focused, um, they no longer focus on building monumental tombs, but focused on um, having a small um, alcove in a big shaft in a communal place in a very sacred um, spot of the landscape. And this is how the um, priests would promote the new uh, graveyard that the business that they start by getting all these um, communal tombs close to one of the big landmarks in Saqqara. That's why it's very close to Zosar, it's very in the precinct of the Bupastian, close to Unis, um, close to Titi. Um, and this is those excavations and even Zahi's new discovery uh, in the cemetery of Titi, it proves that idea that. The chain, they administer the business of the funeral and selling uh, graveyards. And also we have to look at Memphis and the community of Memphis itself and how Memphis was a huge metropolis at the time with the people living there, different um, ethnicities, Egyptians and uh, Greeks, um, foreign immigrants, everybody living in that huge city that was always the capital of Egypt, administrative capital of Egypt. So overpopulated city, then you would see the, the people buried in Saqqara with so many different segments of the society, so many different titles and um, a thriving funeral business also. So, but this cup, uh, as you said, it's, um, it's coming from one of the shafts, um, not very clear as to where exactly because this is an ongoing excavations. So the information is not much. Uh, but it's coming from one of the shafts in the uh, in the precinct of uh, the Bubastian, and it makes perfect sense. Uh, felines and the Temple of Busted. So it's amazing. I must have been confused because I thought it was found in one of your one no. of your ones. Was it was it featured in your documentary? No, it's a different document. You're mixing oh. documentaries now. <laughs> Too much Egyptology documentary, Vanessa, <laughs> and then coming to my class. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. I understand. I understand exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, Ma Mabruk has uh, raised his hand to ask a question. Mabruk. Hi. Hello. Zek. Yeah, you can hear. <laughs> Thank you all for 
this great uh, interview with Dr. Uh, Ramadan Hussein and uh, all those uh, uh, Curtis Woodside, he like looking forward to let us all together uh, gathering for his uh, creative interviews. And uh, really thank you today for uh, see you all. Yeah, and uh, my question is uh, just um, what the source, uh, you know, all like there is inside the tombs, how the gorgeous colors um, uh, they paint inside the tombs and mm -hmm. just what the, so uh, what the source of the light inside the tombs, like there is many theories saying maybe there is like mirror and uh, they wear uh, uh, the light of source. It was like reflector inside mm -hmm. the tombs. So that's like always I'm looking forward and it's like making me more create how they get the light inside the tomb and it was very long inside it. Mm -hmm. So it's just, um, uh, well, it's, it's a very important question. In fact, I have a friend of mine, um, she was, uh, she did her dissertation on uh, artificial lighting in Egypt and light and, and the practical side of it and the ritual side of it. But um, uh, I would have to check what she wrote about this. But before I check, I can tell you that um, usually we have in the archeological records uh, so many torches um, and those torches would be um, either a small plate with um, yeah. some oil in there. And then you have a wick and you would see even on those plates of the burning, when the wick started to go down, the burning yeah. on the edges, you know exactly where the oil is. So we know on the practical side, um, from the archeological record, we have very good evidence that the Egyptians deep down in these shafts, in, inside these tombs, they were using uh, torches, mostly um, oil and a wick. And this is also what you would see uh, represented on the tomb walls. But it definitely, there is so many um, uh, facts to this side. I would um, check this dissertation and um, we'll write to you exactly what's in there. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Thank so you. Sophia has raised her hand. Ooh. Ooh, I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hi Ramadan, thank you so much for an amazing interview. It was so interesting. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I suppose you did answer quite a few questions I've got written here already. But firstly, I want to say thank you so much for finding that mummification workshop because for me, it's the <laughs> greatest discovery. Um, it's, it's incredible. And actually, I think what's really inc incredible is that is subterranean as well mm -hmm. because nobody ever imagined especially the ibu as he was saying yeah. we always thought of it as a tent mm -hmm. so you know it actually makes more sense that it would be subterranean and if you think about mummification the process itself i could never imagine it being carried out in the heat yeah so i think that is a remarkable discovery mm -hmm. but i actually wanted to ask you i was going to ask you when will the gcms results be coming out yes <laughs> be published. but the other question i had yeah. was actually about the six canopic jars yes. which is very unusual i think it's the first time ever yeah. that six canopic jars was it dd bastard i'm trying to yeah. Yeah. yeah so do you think this is an anomaly a one-off, or do you think we're going to find more? Yeah, um, I just wanted to make a comment on uh, the subterranean uh, Wabit, the workshop. Uh, I was, when we announced this discovery in 2018, the anatomy department in Tübingen just called me and they said, okay, we hear you found embalming material, come give us a lecture. We want a lecture in the anatomy department. Uh, it's going to be the faculty, the graduate students, and that's it. And I was like, why the anatomist is calling me? So I went there and this is the good thing about, you know, talking to completely different discipline. I went there and offered exactly the material as I found it and my explanation to it. And by the end, the head of the department um, was first comment, he said, listen, everything you said about the subterranean workshop um, is perfect environment for evisceration. 
uh, because you don't in Egypt you don't want this heat and the flies coming in everything and it's it's this long process of 70 day mummification would be happening in a very hot environment this is no good um, but he had his like but I have one question for you 13 meter deep uh, where did the Egyptian get the air to flow in uh, this workshop because he, it's going to be stuffy and at this point I started smiling and I was happy because I knew exactly the answer. And his question gave me an explanation of a feature that I have seen already, which is the second dynasty tunnels. This uh, embalming workshop, the Wabit, you reach through um, a shaft by nine meter deep. This shaft cuts through a second dynasty tunnel, this big, huge network underground in Saqqara. And then it goes four meter deeper to open up this big uh, room. And I, when we were there, we could feel how the air is speeding inside these tunnels and running really quickly and then comes down to this room. It cools it completely down. And we have about the ratio, the variation, the temperature variation is about 15 uh, degrees difference from above ground. And it was so cool. You'd be standing above ground. It is so humid and hot. But you go down in this room because of this tunnels, uh, it's becoming now an air shaft that's becoming the, their ventilation system, which is, says something important about the Dynasty 26 embalmers. They knew exactly where these uh, tunnels are. When they cut them, they're not just appropriating them for burials, but also they're converting them to a ventilation system that makes sure the environment is conducive to that very uh, grisly process of evisceration. So this made me so happy to hear it from an uh, anatomist. And then they had to show me their ventilation system in the, what they call it, um, the injection room in uni tubing. When the cadaver comes, they have to inject it with uh, formaldehyde. So showed me this, the whole ventilation system, it's huge. So this is just a, um, uh, a comment, as you exactly said, it's perfect environment. We didn't know it would be underground, but it makes perfect sense this evisceration could happen underground. Um, the, uh, we will publish um, the results of our residue analysis, hopefully by mid this year. Uh, we're the, the archaeometrist is finalizing his report and we are checking it. I will provide the archaeological um, context for it. Uh, we're pretty hopeful that we can go to nature with it. So we'll talk to nature first. Uh, we'll talk to different uh, chemistry journals uh, first. So once, hopefully by mid this year, we can announce it. Um, the DD busted situation, the six canopic stars is first for me. I've been looking for something, the anomaly that's more than four canopic stars. And I have just heard about uh, Queen uh, Iput of King Titi um, of Dynasty Six. She had five canopic jars, and I haven't checked the reference yet. So it's interesting always to see this, you know, exception. And of course, for me, when we found these extra two canopic jars of uh, Tadi de Busted, I was thinking about one of two things: either uh, remnants of the embalming materials of Didi Busted will be stored with her in these two canopic jars, or some other organ. And um, I can't say what organ it is, but we were happy that um, Dr. Sahar Salim was, you know, with us and we had the CT scan and we're very, CT scanning canopic jars is not something that's been done um, on a large scale in Egyptology. So we're, maybe we are the second project or the third project to do such uh, CT scanning of canopic jars. So the report, we are also working on the report right now to, we're happy, I'm personally happy that there is human tissue in there. What kind of organ this be? This is something you have to talk to Sahar Salim about and know exactly how to do it. And, and speaking of children and Didi, Didi Busted, one child in Egypt um, sent me a voice message asking me why you didn't take out the the stuff from Didi Bostic Canopic jars and know exactly to know exactly what's in there. So it's a very good question that I had to explain to him. Listen, 
if we take it out, it's going to be a complete a complete pile of dust. We're not going to gain any information from it. But with the CT scan, we can have the measurements. We can know the shape of the content, even when uh, it is still inside the vessel. So this is what I meant by having very getting very good questions from children. Thank you. My pleasure. I see uh, Jose has raised his hand, and then I think we'll take one more question after Jose, and then we'll... Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Go on. So um, my question is about, um, what do you think about the approachment that some people have? Oh, well, for example, in my case, I live far away from Egypt, and my, my approachment to Egypt was through movies and through Hollywood. Uh -huh. So I would like to know, what do you think about uh, the depictions of ancient Egypt in movies? And uh, as a teacher, I would like to know how could I encourage my students to be interested in Egyptian history? Ah, um, it's Egypt, um, how Hollywood is approaching Egypt. Um, it's basically um, a business uh, theme that they can work on. Um, you don't want to also, you have to understand those are people about creativity, uh, creative art, uh, not about the facts in general. It's about storytelling. So you need a story that is very interesting. You don't want to be heavy on facts and things like that. Um, how they portray Egypt, mummies, scary things, <laughs> um, zombie like creature, of course, you don't want that. But would you think Hollywood would sit down and talk about our embalming workshop as an idea for a movie production? I don't think it would sell. People are not going to be excited about the business of embalming and the funeral home. This is on the academic level and, you know, people who are interested to know about things. But as entertainment, I don't think what we talk about is entertaining. It's inter entertaining for us because we, we do this. Um, but I do understand um, why they approach Egyptian culture this way. It's mostly entertainment business. So you have to give them this side. How accurate this um, portrayal of Egyptian culture, this is a completely different issue. And here comes the role of documentaries, archeological documentary films. Uh, and that's why when I started saying I never wanted to do this, but unless there is a message, there is a complete different rhetoric, there is a complete different approach. Um, this is what you need to do. Documentaries is the place where you can uh, bring entertainment with the facts together. That's why I was very happy when National Geographic said, your program is going to be actuality program and I've learned this term from them that's a bus that's a film making business talk here actuality not reality reality is now we all know it's scripted but actuality is um, the actual things that happen on the field they they discuss your schedule and what you have to do and then they set up their cameras not annoying you they come with questions related to the story that you want to tell so um, as a teacher, you always have to direct your students to um, documentaries, um, not, in, not Hollywood production, because you know, this is a little bit of facts and a lot of imagination and creativity for entertainment. That's exactly why, like me, I make documentaries and I want to entertain, yeah. but educate yeah. about the facts in an entertaining way. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So I see we have a question from Keith. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum as salam. Uh, first of all, I, I wake up every morning and Didi Bastet is in my head. Awesome. <laughs> and, and there's brief moments where the other name that you said comes up, but I can't, re my memory's shot, and, but it occasionally pops up. Um, the question I had, you answered one of them regarding the uh, ventilation. The other one was, how in the world did they get up and down those shafts efficiently? Because I yeah. saw you going up and down inside of a pail. Yeah, um, I used to go up and down on ropes before uh, that stairs. Uh, mm -hmm. the, this this um, the stairs we built uh, after we finished excavating this uh, 30 meter deep shaft, um, and because I had 
some important uh, and key members of the team that needed to go down um, and to do the work, all the female members of the team, that I rely on them completely in the documentation and excavation and everything. So, and also for safety reasons. I could go up and down the shaft with this um, wooden winch and people will rail you down and rail you up and all this, but um, it's fun as you saw it, um, but it's very dangerous with a big shaft like this. Right. So as for the Egyptians, how they go, went up and down this shaft, Egyptians were fantastic. They never left anything unexplained for us. There is a nice ostracon from Deir and Medina where they show um, the, uh, a shaft and inside the, there's a figure of an individual going down the shaft um, having their feet on the footholds on the two sides of the shafts. So every, always when you go down, uh, when you dig, the Egyptians, when they dig shaft, they make sure there is a small hole on the two sides, two opposite sides of the shaft. So people, when they go down, they can put their feet uh, in the two holes and use them as ladder and go up and down this way. This on the small shafts. And it's very close because it's about one meter, one meter and a half maximum. Right. But in K24, the footholds, they didn't do it on the opposite walls of the shafts. They do it in the corner. So whoever going down, up and down, they used to put the hands, uh, foot in there and hands as well. And also uh, for safety measure, measures, they will be tied these people with ropes. Uh, this is very nice. Uh, and I like this ostracon from Der Medina because it explains all, it shows the shaft, it shows the burial chamber, it shows even inside tombs, uh, coffins that has been already lowered down and it's in there and another Undertaker coming down um, on this um, that on that method. Okay. Did they also um, create the sarcophagus lids and everything down there in the shafts from the this side is, of the walls? But for always a question on our mind. Uh, I will be sitting down and with uh, uh, my friend uh, and um, uh, and team member, Dr. Ayman Hamid. He's a geologist. He's seen. Um, a mining engineer. So he knows everything about rocks and how rocks moves and everything. And we sat down and we discussed where these um, sarcophagi would have come from. Either they cut from the bedrock itself or they're coming from outside. Um, if you think about the geological column of Saqqara and how Saqqara is geologically composed, you get this always a soft layer, then a hard layer soft layer, then a hard layer, limestone, and usually three meter in, in height of each layer. So the Egyptian, he was always saying, you know, the Egyptians are very smart. Once they get through the soft, the hard layer, they use the soft layer for burial because in a matter of day, he can have a hallway and niches, and this is really soft to dig through. But, um, in the area where we are, the quality of the limestone is not really the same quality of this sarcophagi and the lids that we found 30 meters deep. But we're still working, entertaining these two hypotheses. Either they're being cut from the layer 30 meter deep limestone, or they brought from the outside. And for to answer this question, we have uh, talked now about two geology students um, one from Egypt, one from Spain, who will do um, um, a geological study of the limestone sarcophagi and the entire um, geology of the shaft itself, the rocks. So we see the rock formation of both the sarcophagi and the shaft itself, whether it is coming, it's locally quarried in the shaft or it's brought from outside. So right. this question we're going to answer when we conclude. Hello. Yeah, it's so interesting, Ramadan, about that. I've always also thought about that. So I see um, Yasmin, uh, Yasmin Al-Shazli. She says, uh, my students once gave a presentation on lighting uh, in ancient Egypt, and they kept talking about ancient Egyptian light bulbs. When I told them... <laughs> I know what she's talking about. <laughs> when I told them there were no light bulbs in ancient Egypt, they said... Yeah. It's a theory. And I told them, no, it's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a theory. <laughs> yeah, 
yeah. than imagination. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I think we've got the, the questions done from the audience. Thank you so much, everybody. For Can your I questions. add something, Curtis? Of oh, please. Yes. That's what happens when you do, when students do their research on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> they don't know what the right sources exactly. are. Exactly. <laughs> what the reliable sources are. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, true. exactly. And they always try and talk about the Dendera light bulb. Yes, uh, exactly. Uh, there's an explanation for what that means. But anyway, Curtis, is there? I see there's a lot of um, uh, comments on the chat. Uh, is there a way, a way to send me those comments? I can. I can uh, export it. I think, um, yeah. or I can just copy it before we end. I will do so. Okay. Thank and uh, before we leave, also, uh, I see Sofia Paolo is there. He was. I told you, my family can't leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> no, what's for dinner? Where's tea? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Hi, guys. Here he is. Ciao. Hello. 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 Dinner. Ciao. Ciao. I listened to a bit of your um, lectures. Amazing. Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. And my cat's here as well. Let's meet the cat. Ramadan, we meet all the pets. Uh, the farm is nice. Uh, well, What's I have a, you know, I have a revolution going on at home. They all want a cat. The and the kids want a cat. And, uh, and I say, no cats in the house. And then uh, they, they fire back. But Egyptian domesticated cats. So, <laughs> like, uh, Sophia, let's see the cat again. What's your name? It's Hinks. Hinks. Hinks, oh, hello. <laughs> Can you see him? Let me move back a little bit. Can you see him? Oh, so cute, so cute. <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you so much. Just one little, one little one. Uh, <clears throat> now, your wonderful lecture, I thoroughly enjoyed it, Ramadan, but now you're in Germany. Now, the command of languages and how she must be mind bending. I mean, yes, you had Egyptian, you had Amer well, English, uh, American version of English, and then you're in Germany. Now, you said about what struck me, you said your, you had your hardest task was getting your, your son to do his homework. And I was thinking, is it in German? Is it Egyptian? Is it in English? Yeah. <laughs> uh, your, yeah. uh, how is German? I, I, I mean, you yeah, must be. yeah, his bilingual uh, speaks German and English because um, uh, English is um, our uh, yeah, the the Sprache zu Hause. So this is our. Um, but just uh, speak Deutsch. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> yes. So I have to catch up with my children because they speak both English and German. So, um, but he's um, yeah, they're doing a German school, of course, and. Uh, they love the English classes because this is no effort for them. So. No, no, no. Yeah. How about the Egyptian? I mean, are they? Um, I have, I have, I blame myself for not to introduce an Arabic to them. Um, but I hope it was very difficult, you know, growing up uh, having English and then German. Um, <laughs> it's it's difficult for them, but um, hopefully in the near future I can start some Arabic with them. It's better to, to, to start learning the languages young. So get them started. Yeah. Before the age of nine, oh. it's the best. I want, I, well, yeah. I want to do, uh, to teach them hieroglyphs, but yes. I need some assistance. But <laughs> so <laughs> but we'll see. Yeah, I, I learned to read Arabic before the age of nine. Uh -huh. I, I can read Arabic and I can read Farsi and Urdu. Oh. To be honest, um, the Arabic, I don't remember it. Uh -huh. I, mean, I can read it, but I, I, I don't understand what I'm reading. <laughs> well, <laughs> I did try and learn, but for some reason, my brain only remembers the bad words. Yeah, it comes around. You only need, uh, so uh, <laughs> you need a few months in Cairo, and then yeah. it will be perfect. Yeah. How many children do you have? We have three. We have three children. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Martha and Ben are twins, and uh, Joey is the older. Where did you meet your wife? What's uh, a brown? <laughs> brown is Angela was um, was studying uh, Mediterranean archaeology, 
um, and she was in in the what what is now the Tchaikovsky Institute, uh, but now I now was at the Egyptology. So we both met at Brown. Do they swap languages? Or I had some friends who had two languages, and in mid sentence they'd switch one language to the other, which was most confusing. <laughs> yeah, you, you see, of course, the uh, it was interesting to watch Martha and Ben because they're twins, and to see how. Um, they growing up with both German and English. Um, and Mar for Martha, it was uh, German more close to herself when she identifies herself or talk about her emotions. If she is uh, uh, a little bit uh, sad or upset, she would switch completely to German and start saying German things. Uh, but this is clearly when she um, want to express herself. But now they're both, their German and English is very good. Uh, ben is always uh, surprising me because he leaves home, he switches completely. Uh, he knows home is the English environment. Um, I, when I go to um, uh, school meetings with the teachers and I see him speaking German, I was like, is this my son? He's just like, I don't hear you speaking German. He's like, yeah. You, my son, <laughs> but, yeah, because he um, it's very amazing to look at Ben and how he's making this distinction between two environments. At home, we only speak English, and in outside of the home, he speaks uh, German. Martha would have would mix them a little bit, but now, um, it's uh, she's also getting to the point that she's like Ben. But it's very interesting to see uh, twins, how they grow bilingual and who is mixing what and who is having the clear distinction. About it would be funny if, if one twin learned one language and another twin learned another language. <laughs> <laughs> it would be very difficult. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah. As, as Yasmin said, uh, not Yasmin, Sophia, as she said, she only remembers the bad words. I know only the bad words in Farsi. So um, that's uh, yes. Bad words is the first things to, you learn in any language. I <laughs> used to speak Spanish when I was little. I lived in El Salvador, and yes. all I could say, well, I I spoke fluently, but I used to swear all the time. <laughs> bad words. Very bad yeah. words. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, thank you so so much, everybody, for all your questions. I know we have so many people online, and I'm going to copy the the messages. Yes, send them to, to Ramadan so you can read through them. Yeah. Um, and if you want to contact Ramadan, he is on Facebook or you can check out uh, his website. Yeah. He is available there. So yes, thank you so much you. everybody for joining. And uh, just a reminder, on Friday I am talking to Kara Cooney. And oh, uh, yeah, and then uh, next week uh, I've been speaking to a very special lady um, today, uh, you might know her as uh, Fiona, the Countess of Carnarvon. Um, nice. She will be uh, she'll be joining us sometime uh, next week. We're just uh, busy setting up the dates. So uh, you're doing awesome, Gert. Oh, thank you you're so much. But thank you for for giving me the opportunity to talk to you. <laughs> My pleasure. You all the stories about the discoveries, I really appreciate it so much. My pleasure. Thank you thank so you. much, Ramadan. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, Thank everyone. you so much. It was a great interview. Really enjoyed Thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you so much for this wonderful interview. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. It's been wonderful. Thanks, Curtis. Thanks, Ramadan. It's been absolutely great. <laughs> Hi, Ramadan. How are you? I'm good. How are you, Sophia? Hi, Ramadan. I'm really good. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, uh, we, uh, we, um, Sophia and I know one another through uh, Facebook and other social media things. We haven't met yet, <laughs> but, so it's oh, the corona so time. But we do, have, uh, we do have some nice conversation about uh, medicine and mummification and stuff. <laughs> she, was, she was very nice in her uh, latest uh, uh, podcast to talk about my project and things like that. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. You're welcome. <laughs> For those Listen, of you don't know, ask you, ask you. For sorry. Those of you, for those of you who don't know, Sophia um, is the one who helped me arrange the the interview today with with Ramadan. I I had the feeling. <laughs> yeah, because, yeah, she wrote to me, and then you wrote to me right after. <laughs> so it's like okay, <laughs> she did that. 
I, I, I got a lot of requests from people saying, oh, please interview Ramadan. And I was thinking, I don't really know oh, Ramadan. You. So how, no, how do I you. just ask him out of nowhere? So I no, asked absolutely. Sophia, can she? Yeah. Oh. So she My did. pleasure. My pleasure. Yes, yeah, so we talked about it the other day, didn't we, Curtis? And you yeah. said you'd ask Sophia to. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I see Derek's here. Marissa? I see, I see uh, my beloved mother-in-law over there, Roz. Oh, Ooh. hi, Roz. Hello, mother-in-law. Hello. She's tuning, she's tuning in from uh, Crafts in Pittsburgh. How are you doing? How are you? Uh, you need to... We have a lot of snow. Oh, you do? Uh, yes. <laughs> it's nice. It's nice. Well, I bet uh, the kids now would love to see it, to come and see Roz, and they'll be jumping around. And, at me, and here's my father-in-law coming in. <laughs> Here I am. <laughs> so hi. I was uh, I was just telling them the the grandchildren will be jumping on our backs now, making stuff and trying to grab their attention. And hey, Papu, I did this. Hey, Roz, I did this. <laughs> so it's better to come to the office and do it. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, it like uh, nice to see the children. <laughs> Sorry, it was me interrupting again. I said it was a, would have been nice to have met his children. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you don't want to see them. <laughs> <laughs> we do, we do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, especially this morning i mean this morning and since last night um just avoiding completely passing by the room and it's just come biological hazard today you don't want to go there <laughs> the smell and everything i was like no and then usually i am the one who's bringing this up at home so angela today was the one who was like yelling and screaming in the morning about how filthy everything is i was like okay thank you i'm validated now <laughs> so, oh goodness goodness no you don't want this and especially now they're, they're home all the time they didn't do anything <laughs> and it's like uh homeschooling uh on bed while there is a lot of food around and things <laughs> it was like no <laughs> not so much uh, your homeschooling is very tough because this is what my brother's doing with my niece. Uh -huh. um, and yeah, he's finding it really difficult. It's, it's not I, I was homeschooled and I, I did fine. It's different uh, though. We yeah, don't want yeah. to. Yeah. I was just doing fourth grade math with one of the twins. I wanted to throw it, the computer out the window. That's why I, I was late getting on. Uh, I have twins too. And oh, you do? <laughs> oh my God, so I, I completely <laughs> understand. Ramadan and I, I get you, I get you. Yeah. But Angela would be the same, you know? It's like uh, throwing things in. I, because when I teach them, um, I show them the Egyptian father, which is very tough. It's not, wow. it's not that European American kind of version of Ramadan. It's the Egyptian one. So Ooh, the Egyptian one is different. Come to my house and do that for my kids. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's very welcome to join you. All right, let's do it. Yeah, Common yeah, Core. Yeah. But it's snowing so much here. If I threw the computer out the window, nothing <laughs> would happen to it. We have like two feet of snow. Yeah. It's funny. That's why we would like. Uh, um, Do you teach them Egyptology, Ramadan? Actually, they're not very interested. Martha is started to uh, get interested um, in mummies and stuff like that. Uh, ben, not so much. Um, I don't know. It might be he's probably hiding it from me. But um, anyway. does he come around with you? Or, 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 uh, he one time uh, we were watching uh, Kingdom of the Mummies at one of the, the National Geographic program, and after the program, he he looked at me and was like, "I need to get myself my own show." I was like, "Okay, go get yourself your own show now." So, so I, see, to... <laughs> I see we have Yasmin on. Hi, Yasmin. Salam. Hello. Hi. Hi, Yasmin. Hi, Ramadan. How are you? Good. How are you? All is good. How's the moving? Horrible. Well, almost <laughs> done, but it's never ending. <laughs> I haven't moved yet. I'm in my in-laws apartment <laughs> until oh. I oh finish. Hopefully Friday. Yeah. <laughs> Where is that, Yasmin? I'm going to uh, Sheikh Zayed, which is closer to, G to the Giza pyramids. <laughs> mm -hmm. Ah, right. 6th of October. Yeah. Yeah. 
we're so scattered across yeah. the world it's amazing yes it's uh yeah the same interest it's great and i'm originally from the office, so i'm going the other side <laughs> are you excited though i am i am there's a garden and the kids can play and they're stuck in an apartment all day so it's been yeah. stressful <laughs> yeah. during covid no, it, it, it spoils yeah. some up when you find that your fur your furniture in effect isn't been delivered to us one <laughs> Ramadan, I'm Marilyn Massey. I'm the one that was fascinated with your National Geographic series and tracked you down okay. and uh, was delighted to be included in this today. I'm okay. from Colorado Springs, Colorado. Well, thank you. Thank you I'm so glad much. you liked it. Thank you much so much. better than attending college classes today. We, we cheated and we came to you instead. <laughs> oh, great, great, great. Well, there's a lot more coming, so stay tuned. We will be here. I'm, I'm bringing all of our students and um, you will see us here from now on. I've let everyone know we are learning from Dr. Zahi Hawass and Dr. Tofik and Ramadan and Olga. And it's amazing. And I've, I've encouraged the students to join in because I've learned so much from you over the past year. And now that we're getting our degrees in Egyptology, I knew they needed to meet you because oh. you are exquisite. Oh, thank you so much, Kim. Uh, next time we're on, put, put, put the whole class on. Let's say hi, okay. Let's do it, let's do it. Great. Thank you so much, everybody. Enjoy, your, enjoy the rest of your day for the Americans and uh, come back Friday and check back for, for the Carnarvon interview. <laughs>